Oh, that's quite loud. This is new to me as well. Um, so this is going to be sort of more as an introduction to a set of research questions than to really show you results or analysis from anything. And uh, we will be getting into not just sort of how, how we got into thinking about these questions in the lens of network analysis in the first place. So this is a collaboration with uh, Rosie and Rasmus, among others. And as Jonathan just mentioned, we've been supported to just start this project with some fantastic seed support from bids. And we really view this as laying the groundwork for some much sort of larger directions that we're trying to build into. And so today, I'm going to be trying to explore kind of the depth and breadth of that groundwork. And I'm trying to pitch this very much that it should be accessible to an audience that is not a specialist in environmental science or ecology, but sort of some of the broad issues that I think our field faces that may be analogous to what other fields are seeing as well. There's really two sides to this talk and to the research we're proposing, both in theory and in data, and then this fabulous spider from Mersey. Um, and we're going to be exploring both aspects and limitations on both sides of those uh, divides and how they fit together. And so I'll be moving back and forth between issues in theory and issues in data, and then ways we're trying to address both of them. So I also want to say that we're doing this motivated by the some of the larger context of really what we see as some of the biggest questions in our field. Uh, we are in an era of immense global change, as you all know, and this presents sort of really great challenges to us, not just as scientists, but as citizens of the world over the next century. Uh, well known to you are issues like global climate change. And of course, as this figure shows, that's a very multidimensional problem, not just in sort of a single measure of, say, increasing temperature average worldwide, but on all of the different elements of our system that that impacts water resources, biodiversity, oceans, energy, land use, human health, agriculture, and so forth. Um, but there are many other things that are going on at the same time that are also impacting those same systems. It's not all about climate. Uh, as we have seen this this past summer, forest fires uh, are interacting with that and with our changing ways in which we approach managing forest fire systems. And these have impacts not just to the ecology the, of forest ecosystem, but also to the humans that live in that and those constrain what we can do. So it all becomes part of that picture. Uh, there's also just exploitation of natural resources like fisheries, this figure from 2006 projecting uh, historical declines across uh, all of the exploited marine taxa, just showing the number that have collapsed over time. Uh, quite controversial just how you add up these numbers, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, sort of getting to these large picture global trends a little bit later. Uh, in addition to exploited species, we have worries about uh, endangered species worldwide from increased human activity. And uh, this paper, just looking at that in the most stark language of, could we be entering the sixth mass extinction? If you compare the extinction rates that we have seen just in the last couple hundred years to extinction rates that we see on paleontological timescales, you can see that most of the time there's a background rate of maybe two extinctions per million species years. And if you compare that to what we see in many of the species today, we're getting up close to those numbers uh, at total extinction rates. So maybe this is an extinction on par with the global mass extinctions we have seen historically in the fossil record is a pretty frightening thought. But this is also a time of immense opportunity from the data that we now have available that is really challenging the way that we go about research in our field, or at least has the potential to do so. Of course, that includes things like satellite imagery, where we can now get snapshots of almost anywhere in the world many times a day at high resolution uh, in many different spectra, opening up a totally new source of terabytes of data. And then at much more local scales, such as flying little drones through the forest, if you want to learn how to do that, you can go to uh, the ESPN faculty member and BID senior fellow Maggie Kelly will do, do, uh, runs a drone school in the summer. Fantastic program. Um, and this brings in another source of data from individual cameras and other sensors you can put on that, down to sort of tiny GPS sensors we can put on things now as small as rodents or even dragonflies. Uh, so there's also an immense digitization of existing knowledge. So it's not all about technology and new data coming in that's being collected at this moment, but often perhaps more valuably data that has just been hidden in dark archives or just been inaccessible to us to do research on that can allow us to get much more farther back into the past of the past at least, say, 100 years of industrial impacts on global environments. So digitization of things like 
observational field notes to digitization of museum specimens into 3D images or exposing the specimen records that are there and all of the data that's associated with them. All of these changes are sort of presenting us with this uh, new opportunities to think about data, most um, dramatically perhaps illustrated by large-scale NSF efforts, such as uh, the National Ecological Observatory Network, which really looks to the sort of the model of weather stations and weather forecasts and saying, could we do the same for ecological systems if we had ecological monitoring stations? And invested to the tune of nearly half a billion dollars over the next 30 years, putting up uh, identically structured and designed and spec monitoring stations all throughout the US uh, that would be collecting ecological data ranging from uh, insect pitfall traps to you can see this little mouse with a radio tagger to LIDAR flyovers and satellite images and embedded sensors on the ground, really trying to, across the diverse number of biomes we have in the US system, giving us standardized data on regular intervals from sensors that are out there sitting in lakes that measure every second to people going out and counting and doing IDs on beetles and pitfall traps on the scale of months. Uh, yeah, what's the status of NEON? NEON went online, I think, last year with all of the sites. It's been rescoped a little bit. Uh, this is the first time ecology as a field has really attempted this kind of large-scale science that has been, you know, de rigueur in physics and others for a long time. And it had quite a number of hiccups going forward. And I think there's a fair question of to what extent this is going to be embraced by our community. Not everyone was excited to see all of this funding going into one source. And, not, and we're certainly not used to analyzing data that comes in this way. And so our, as a community as a whole, we're not all ready to start making any use of that data. You'll see the examples of other studies we tend to do everything sort of in-house. And so there's a big question of sort of, will this continue to be successful? So yes, the infrastructure is now on the ground. They have put in all of that. So we're, we're, we're deep in, all of the investment is in. Now, running this for the next 30 years, and if it fails, will ecology ever like return to kind of big scale uh, systems analysis like this? Who knows? So there's some open questions there. Uh, uh, analogous case is the Ocean Observatory Initiative. This is over a billion dollar investment, though ocean geosciences are a little bit more familiar with these large scale operations and things have gone a little bit more smoothly. You can see much the same spirit of uh, more buoys giving continuous measurements down to automated glider submersibles going through the ocean to manned ship expeditions giving new measurements. So, but a big linked initiative to create a huge amount of data uh, coming from ocean ecosystems as well. You put all this together and you get a remarkably rapid rise in the total number of petabytes, if you will, of data that we have available to us. These projections came out in 2011, uh, saying that you know today, at that time, we have maybe order of a single petabyte, and there's just a huge growth. You can see two pieces making up the most of that model or simulation data, particularly important in climate systems, uh, where we have relatively reasonable large-scale simulations giving us projections, and satellite and radar data. You can't see the in-situ data on that bottom, but it's an incredibly important source, if not a lot in bytes, providing us most of the information about the actual ecology of what's going on, individual species measurements, the kind of boots on the ground truth that without that, the other pieces of data can be relatively useless. One of the takeaways that I have when looking at that, though, is just the extent to which most of the data is yet to come. A theme of the way we're trying to go about this is trying to emphasize not just doing science, but doing science in a reproducible uh, way that encourages our colleagues to follow along and replicate those bits of analysis. And so if we are yet to get most of our data, we need to be doing our analysis in a way that we have a funnel there waiting for the data that is going to be stacking up in those archives to come in and see if the results that we have found with that small spear of the data we have today still hold when we get the data of tomorrow. So far, that is not the way we have approached analyses in our fields, and it's hard work from the beginning to go and replicate any of those existing results with these vastly uh, increased amounts of data that are now available. So there are challenges on the theory side as well. We have focused a lot on small numbers in theory, on maybe one or two species. And in this context, we've done remarkably well. But our pensive polar bear there is kind of worried about the fact that you know, ecology doesn't begin and end with one or two species. So um, with single species or few species, you're all probably familiar with the Lack of Altera models and 
uh, interacting dynamical systems. You have two species, and maybe in a nice snowy plain, there really are mostly just two species, and you can get a good description of the ecology. And uh, we can explain the ways in which that can create cycles and understand that with great precision. We've continued to have a lot of success in individual species studies. This one in Trebolium, so this is a flower beetle. Uh, in this particular example, this is work by Bob Constantino and colleagues. Uh, in the 90s, showing that you could create chaos in the population dynamics of these uh, beetles. And you see a classic chaotic bifurcation attractor there going in. If you manipulate these beetles just right, like we always knew the logistic map should look, some populations should be described their growth by a logistic map if they have high enough growth rate. And lo and behold, we can make that happen in single species. You'll hear that we have questions about how important that is. More recently, a result showing that while well, we know that Theoretically, systems should be able to have alternate stable states from having complicated density-dependent nonlinear interactions. And we can, again, demonstrate those kind of processes in a lab in single species. You'll note that there's no nice picture of the lab setting here because this was done by a physicist, and it's when physicists apparently don't like to take photographs of their study organisms. This was done in yeast uh, by uh, Lee Dai at Jeff Gore's lab at MIT. But a fantastically precise, it's hard for me just looking at this figure to believe this is actual data that you're seeing there, those error bars, showing this classic bifurcation diagram. And they're able to manipulate these yeasts and push them closer and closer to this tipping point and see the tipping point as they just are diluting their beakers with their growing yeast more and more. And it happens exactly the way you'd expect with the mathematics. You see there's a stable point and an unstable point. They come closer, they collide, they annihilate, the population crashes. It's a fantastic example, but in a single species in a lab. Unfortunately, our main conclusion and theoretical ecology over the past 50 years has been to point out just how little this really tells us about the real world. We write to write as there is paper after paper with the message that blank matters. Uh, Bjornstad and Grenfell have picked up on this trend in about 2001 saying, yes, we've concluded everything matters. Uh, we, we, we put it in more colorful terms. Usually we say scale matters. So we have ecology down at the molecular scale, the organismal scale, population, community, and ecosystem. We have heterogeneity. We have things matter about how space is structured. And so if you've ignored space in your results, then they're probably meaningless because if you introduce space back in, you can get totally different results. And we've known that for such a long time that it's become sin to leave out space in your model. Temporal structure matters as well. Uh, time, things are different over time. We have non-stationary environments and we have stochastic environments. And if we leave that out of your model, then your model is meaningless, right? And the individuals are different. Not all members of a species are identical. They have unique behaviors and they interact with each other. So that can't be ignored as well. Uh, there's dimensionality in the stru aid structure of species interactions. Uh, populations, not all members of the population are in the same age or stage and they interact. And if you leave that out of your model, your model's probably wrong. And then all of the sources of uncertainty, demographic and environmental measurement parameter, and so forth. Now, some people have taken us at our word as we start pointing this out and really just tried to put that all in our models. In fact, this is how we manage fisheries today. I pulled this out of the actual management policies of the Gulf of Alaska Pacific Ocean per Earth stock assessment. And uh, if you're a st statistician in the audience and you realize how little data they actually have available to them, you're probably horrified to read this thing that says the number of parameters we estimated in our hierarchical Bayesian analysis is 134. Yes, this is how we do fisheries analysis. This is what it looks like. There, there's really, you know, some of these parameters here. I haven't fit all 134 there. And you can see most of them are focused really on the single species level, just getting the age structure and the length structure right in there and the fishing mortality. And you just kind of start tacking those bits on top of each other. And you end up with a model that's very hard to believe we have estimated correctly. Um, but it's the best we can do. And it still doesn't have all of the things we might want to have in there, like any other interacting species that are predating on this other than humans uh, as part of the dynamics. So ecology is just such a complicated mess that as we try to put all of these things in, it very quickly becomes intractable. And so this has been our challenge of theory. How do we do go beyond just one and get up to many species. Data can be equally challenging for kind of the same diversity reasons. You know, we don't have a kind of one size fits all data. Data is high dimensional. So we're shifting to from a kind of Arctic imagery to Hawaii, where Rosie gets to do her field work. Um, and the diversity of uh, natural systems there sort of echoes the diversity of our data. So again, data covers these different scales from it's not just the wide satellite images or lo locations of, say, the uh, neon sites down to 
the scale of the individual city or the scale of the actual field to the scale of where individual organisms may be limited to a particular lake, and then all the way on down to the molecular scale, to the genetic scale, to the importance of microbial interactions that are, can be happening in within you know, a single centimeter or micrometer of this whole space here. So we have to deal with data that spans those scales, and it spans that kind of variety as well in the types of data. So whereas we look to bioinformatics often for inspiration of bringing together uh, statistics and computational approaches to biological problems, there, you know, they have the good fortune of often dealing with data that more or less can be reduced to four letters, you know, in different interesting combinations. It turns out there's a lot you can do with that. But ecological data, we don't have this kind of standardized look to the way our data comes. We don't really, as ecologists, like the kind of factory farm approach natively. We just think, oh, that must, uh, you must be sort of losing something when you sort of try to treat all data the same. We really have more of an organic handcrafted variety to our data. And uh, you can see that even in the studies I showed, for instance, Constantino's uh, flower beetles, or even Jeff Gore's yeast collapsing, they you know, control their own data, the, science, the theory and the research on the organism all being done within one group, the data is all collected in one group, may not even be available to the rest of us, and the analysis is handcrafted to the particular problem, and we get these fascinating results. Which has been a fun way to do science, but it's very difficult to get to the large-scale global issues that we began with when we we're constantly going back only to science that's echoed in much more simplified systems. Um, so what is a way forward? One thing that we're looking at is dealing with that scale. Hawaii offers this possibility for this kind of space for time substitution. As we get back into the history, particularly if we look at things that occur in ecological evolutionary processes, it's very, we don't have high resolution satellite imagery to take us back there. But with Hawaii, we can do this kind of space for time substitution where you have old islands that are maybe 5 million years old and much more recent islands, uh, all sort of uh, created out in this chain, and the ecology follows, right? So you could, didn't have any community there before the island existed, so you have kind of a baseline that it couldn't be older than a particular time. This provides us one way to start looking at a diverse amount of data that's available to us now with a spectrum that includes both space and time. Uh, getting that data is hard work, and is again in this... Uh, so Rosie's had this fantastic dimensions of biodiversity effort going through in a bunch of controlled sites. And I'll try not to embarrass her too much by getting too much of this wrong and getting the interaction data of all of the, just the profile of all the species that are there, particularly all the insects that are on every one of those plants. You can shake the plant. I think that you catch it on there and then you can grind up the, plant, the uh, insects that you find, you know, what plants you found them on, and you can uh, do identification for all the different insects using DNA barcoding and find out sort of the profile in the particular location and time and space of all of the species that were present and what they were interacting with at the time that you found them. So this is a, in a controlled, consistent setting, an immense opportunity to start exploring a large scale, getting us far beyond the one or two species that we've typically seen and that I've typically worked with in theoretical systems. How do we integrate that kind of diverse data? We've had a long tradition of eco-informatics in ecology that has operated in a largely separate world uh, that we has seen relatively little influence on the way that we do that day-to-day -day process. And you saw that in the question about neon echoed as well. It's almost a divide in the way, sort of cultural divide in the way that we approach these things. So this is an approach that has come out of the informatics community saying you should be able to, with appropriate annotation of your data. You can collect it the way you like. You organize your data table like this. I organize it like this. And the computer can look at those two things and read the metadata and understand what's going on and automatically synthesize these things. We proposed, this was proposed back in early, uh, early 2000s, 2001. But we have yet to see actual examples of synthetic research being done in this automated fashion. We still always go back and do this process, if we do it at all, by hand and end up with a much sort of higher level picture. Uh, in that process, this is sort of the idealized vision. You have uh, automated measurements or people going to the field, however you acquire your data. It goes immediately in as raw data to a central archive. And then you can continue to do your quality assurance, add additional information, kind of pretty up your data, but no analysis yet. You're just providing quality insurance and metadata. And then you deposit that into the archive. Then we, other researchers can discover your raw data while you move on to the analysis part of this workflow, 
integrate the data, transform the data, combine it with other data from the database, do your analysis, modeling, visualization, and your transformed and integrated data goes into the archive. And then finally, you create a paper, and then that also becomes part of the archive record. We very rarely find examples of this whole process in which there are all four hours complete of the raw data, the annotated data, the transformed data, and the final results ending up in an archive where we can access those conclusions. One compelling example that we are looking to, and we'll see why this is more relevant as well as we start to focus on networks, uh, comes from Globy, doing it sort of a much more lightweight, bootstrapped approach than these large-scale uh, NSF-driven infrastructure projects, which is built on largely on existing tools. So you see these columns of data that individual researchers have been working on, and they put that data up on GitHub. Uh, and if that data is on GitHub, then they tell Globy that it exists, and it shows up in Globy search on GitHub. If they create a little Zenodo archive for it, Zenodo will give them a DOI. It's a data repository. It can give data DOIs, and the data DOI can show up there, and it can be easy to cite. And because it's on GitHub, Globy will go and grab that data and do some basic quality checks. For instance, how many of the names can be resolved? How many different species are there in the data set? And you can see those in the stats there. And then we have information as well, like are there open issues in any one of those data sets? So the data remains sort of in the control and in the style of the individual researchers working on it, but it, at the same time remains part of this larger index. And this is built all in small bits on existing tools rather than the sort of monolithic approach that can be difficult for researchers experimenting with the design of these archives to be able to have input if they're not part of the team design sort of central resource. And then you can see distributed here in sort of common formats. So uh, to kind of get deeper into that, I wanted to highlight this. Of like one of the challenges of starting to integrate those different data sets is just lining up everything. You saw that metaphorically with those columns being lined up with the metadata schema. For us, that's often just lining up, for instance, species names. We don't all use species names in the same way. Uh, being able to cross-reference names against existing uh, authorities to figure out when you said this, that's the same thing as when someone else called it this. And so those are the part of the same record. Uh, so this is an example from Jort, who's here with us and others, putting out a way to kind of go through that process very quickly, linking all of those species sort of building the infrastructure to solve a common problem that as researchers we solve just by hand every day in a way that's perhaps more error prone and certainly not as efficient. Okay, so bits on the data side. I want to turn briefly back to the theory side of what can we do to get beyond these complexity. And I think the first step is to sort of say, well, this is how we've done it before. Great examples in individual, uh, highly controlled system where you can see this dilution factor and the population size. We have well-defined state variables. And then we tend to kind of wave our hands and say, oh, this applies to the global scale. There's actually a fantastic paper that came out of a working group here at Berkeley. Uh, Tony Barnowski was the lead on it. And uh, you can see much the same bifurcation diagram. We're a little bit fuzzy on what we mean now by ecological state. It's no longer the concentration of a particular concentration of yeast in a particular flask. We're remarkably precise about 2045 when the collapse is going to happen. But you know, this is the state of our art, right? And this is not, I don't mean to poo this, this is very influential work. You can see Governor Jerry Brown uh, with Tony Bernowski here discussing this result in the uh, paper that came out. And you can see this little figure here with the poor little black stick figure being crushed by the globe going over the over the end of the cliff. Apparently, that's supposed to be Governor Brown. Um, so the Tipping Points uh, paper was very influential based on theory, but the connection exactly to getting back to the data and to precise points at which we can forecast when things will happen is perhaps a bit vague, you know, and we're left with sort of circling something with question marks. More particularly, it's a bit vague about what our state is supposed to be. When we try to bring in all of the data, we get much less clear pictures than that conceptual diagram. For instance, just trying to see what is the state of overall species counts in this uh, relatively recent paper, Nature, they said, oh, let's just count species richness all throughout the globe and then in common areas like global, polar, temperate, tropical. It's very difficult to bring out large-scale trends. Now, perhaps it's not surprising as ecologists because we know that like, when you aggregate data at this level and you forgot everything else that was going on, like all that little organic differences mattered in those different communities. And so you end up with very apples to oranges comparisons. And it's hard to say that you see 
for instance, a long-term decline in the number of species, which you might have expected from those stories at the beginning about the collapse of fisheries and the higher risk of extinction. But then as we look at it, we're like, well, where did the ecology go in that, and can we get it back in? Uh, just linking those species to environmental variables, again, does a remarkably poor job of predicting where we're going to find those species. Uh, so you can see these figures being centered relatively close to zero, showing a low correlation between where we actually find species and where we would have predicted them based purely on the abiotic environmental layers of data, which are much easier to get, um, and popular niche modeling. So what's missing in both of those things is the fact that species interact. And so that's been our starting point here. Getting to many species, we want to start by looking at not just counting up numbers of species and where they are, but how they're interacting. And how do we measure change and view change through the lens of interactions? This discussion kicked off at a um, uh, working group here at BIDS uh, in GraphXD, where we're looking at examples from uh, Lauren Panasino and others, looking at uh, plant pollinator networks in hedgerows. A hedgerow is introduced in a farm, and this influences uh, the frequency of native pollinators in that population. And so you can see pollinators in yellow and the plants in green here in these networks. And that would so, uh, lead to identifiable state shifts marked by these red bars in the network showing when something has changed. So this was uh, kind of getting our thoughts going on, can we look at change in network structure as instead of the much looser proxies of sort of just counting up all the species? Can we use the interaction data variable to start looking for signs of change? As I mentioned, this coming out of the work in GraphXD, and we hope to kind of continue to use those uh, settings to bring together people with knowledge of the data and of the ecological systems with knowledge of many of the rich new algorithms that are now possible for evaluating data once we can represent it in a generic structure such as a graph. And so at that particular time, we were learning about different examples from mathematics research about ways that they categorize differences in graphs that we will need in order to be able to measure the total amount of change uh, in a network in that way. So just returning to our, my kind of central theme here, so there's work to be done on kind of both sides of these coins in theory and data. And I think another sort of underlying theme behind this is that as moving this work forward requires not just doing new research, but really building the infrastructure that allows other people to move with us, um, changing the way that we think about these problems. And with that, that is not just a technical problem, a software problem, but it, we have learned again and again that that is a social and a community problem. So these are just two groups from ARP and SCI. We have, uh, this was from our retreat in uh, this past um, May, going up to Seattle, that community bringing together a diverse group of people seeing these problems very differently changes uh, both the community's adoption of these approaches and our ability to learn how to build tools that really work the way that other people work. And I think the same is true as we try to bridge from sort of the software technical side to really does this mean anything on the ground in ecology. So I'll leave it at there and I'll take any questions. <laughs>